Well, hello everyone. Uh, great to have you with us at this virtual EEI conference. I have the distinct pleasure uh, now to talk about the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And one of the co-chairs of that is Senator Angus King, an independent from Maine. And he's a terrific guy. Uh, before I turn to him, let me first give you a little bit of the background about Angus. Uh, and, and Angus, I want you to fill this out a little bit, but, but I'll start. Current Senator from Maine, first elected uh, Senator in um, 2012, re-elected 2018. Um, and you're on the, uh, among other committees, Energy, Natural Resources, Intel, uh, the Select Intel Committee, and then Armed Services. Um, you were also Governor of Maine uh, from 1995 to 2003. But this is what I want folks to get, Angus, and I was so interested in this when you and I met. Uh, you have a whole career in energy that you did before you were doing politics. Talk a little bit, you've, you've developed wind projects, uh, energy conservation, and also hydro and biomass. Give the folks just a flavor of your energy background as an as a, uh, entrepreneur. Well, uh, Tom, it's great to be with you and, and we'll get to talk about the commission and you, you made such great contributions. It was so valuable to have you there. Uh, when I first ran for governor in 1994, I used to say I'm the first candidate for governor who's ever applied to the DEP for a permit and also the first candidate who knows the BTU content of a pound of biomass. Uh, <laughs> I've been, uh, I started working in energy in 1983 for a small New England company that did hydro. We went on and did biomass. And then while I was working for that company, I had a crazy idea about conservation and developing uh, conservation and, and uh, working with the utility to uh, essentially buy the conserved kilowatt hours at a considerable discount from what it would have been if we generated that energy. And then I went on from there uh, after I was governor and was a, a partner in the development of a 50 megawatt wind project in, in Western Maine. So um, I've had a lot of involvement with energy uh, for the past, what, I guess it's almost 30 years. Um, and, and that's why I'm so delighted to be on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee because uh, uh, I, can, I can ask some pretty probing questions of some of the people uh, that have been uh, been before our committee. It's it's been a it's been a, a real passion of mine for an awfully long time. I was just thinking this morning for some reason I remember and I'm I'm dating myself now, but I remember being fascinated by windmill ads in the Whole Earth Catalog. Now, Tom, to <laughs> the Whole Earth Catalog is a historical document to you, but no, it was no. current events for me in the 60s and 70s, <laughs> and to. To, to be able to actually help uh, develop, you know, these beautiful uh, two and a half megawatt uh, uh, wind turbines uh, that are, you know, they've been going now for eight or nine years. I understand I'm no longer involved in the business, but they're still cranking out uh, 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 electricity with, with no, no carbon. So I'm, uh, I've had, I have had some background in this and have always uh, been deeply interested in what the energy future is going to be. Believe it or not, Angus, I had a brother, my oldest brother, lived in a VW bus named Rupert uh, in California at one time. And he was subscribed to the Whole Earth Catalog. He used to send me used copies of it, which is pretty interesting. So I know what you're talking you about. But, you know, it's so valuable to have people in politics that really get the private sector. And I think as we talk about Solarium, I think your leadership on that commission, along with Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, was so valuable in understanding what it takes for the private sector to come together um, with, with, you know, whether it's Congress or the administration or the variety of regulators that we have. So you were just an awesome leader. And I really, we really hadn't had the pleasure to get to know each other before then, but you were just terrific. And I want to thank you for that. Hey, well, I, tell, the, tell the folks, Angus, a little bit about how the idea of the commission got together and how you were selected to be one of the co-chairs. Well, the, the commission was first established in the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act. And there was a, a group of us, Ben Sass, Mike Rounds, myself, Joe Manchin, who had sat through hearing after hearing after hearing in armed services. And I'm also on the intelligence committee 
that outlined the cyber threat. And I'll never forget being in the Armed Services Committee and examining the, the uh, director of the NSA, the National Security Agency, and, and asking him, I said, is there anything that we're doing that will cause an adversary to pause in the pursuit of a cyber attack because they fear retaliation? In other words, is there anything that will affect the calculus of an adversary that, that, that we're doing as a country uh, that would slow down an attack? And the answer was no. And that really struck me. And, and that, as you know, that was part of one of the things that I worked so hard on on the commission. But anyway, the commission started in the National Defense Act and um, Ben Sass was the guy, he's a Republican Senator from uh, Nebraska, a good friend. And he uh, urged me to talk to Chuck Schumer uh, and to get appointed. And it was a, there were appointments by the majority and minority leaders. So Ben was appointed, I was appointed from the Senate. Uh, Mike Gallagher, who's a Republican Congressman from Green Bay, Wisconsin, a very impressive guy, was appointed by Paul Ryan. And then Jim Longevin, uh, who's a Democratic Congressman from Rhode Island, was appointed by Nancy Pelosi. So those were the four members. But then there were four members from the government, from the executive branch, uh, 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 Director of National Intelligence, FBI, uh, uh, Department Security. of Defense and, and, uh, and Homeland Security. And then there were six members from the private sector, of which you were one. We had some people from think tanks and people that had a lot of experience in this field. So it was a, it was a diverse uh, commission. But one of the things I'm proudest of, and I think you can attest to this, we had over 30 meetings. We had very high attendance. There was never a moment of partisanship. There was never a breath of, you know, what's the party line on this issue or my my leadership wants me to do this, that, or the other thing. Right, it was, right. it was completely. It was, it was, uh, it was fourteen people that were just doing what they thought was right for the country. And it was, and you heard me say this. We had open discussions. We had some arguments. We had differences. And I, at one, at the end of one of our meetings, I said, "Geez, you know, this is the way that Congress is supposed to work. This is, this is the best legislative experience I've had up here." Uh, but it really was a, an exceptional group, and I think we came out with a very solid report about a very serious problem, as the members of EEI know very well. Yeah, Angus, in fact, I, I love telling people that story. We did have debate, and you sit in there in the room. You can't tell, based on what people are saying, whether they're Democrat or Republican or whatever. And in fact, I always describe it as, as apolitical. It's not bipartisan. It's without partisanship. It's all about right. the good of the country. And, and the fun thing that I think really became clear in the course of creating the work product of this commission, I would argue almost everybody in the United States understands that this is a serious issue, that you, the United States is effectively at war in cyberspace. Companies like mine get attacked millions of times a day. But it's almost, I, I've used this analogy before, it's almost like going to a beach and watching a submarine war you really can't see anything until something cataclysmic happens. And yet we know that the threat is ongoing and lethal. And so pulling people together, knowing that you already have a foundation of an urgency to act, pulling these people together with the kind of expertise we had in that room has really built upon a need to make America stronger and more resilient. The other thing though I would say, well picking up on this nonpartisan issue. I think you and Mike set this tone early on, really drawing upon the old uh, solarium uh, effort that was undertaken by Dwight Eisenhower back in the 50s. I think you guys led us exceedingly well. Well, well how about this? I think Mike, Mike, Gallagher, oh. my, my, Mike Gallagher summed up our mission, I think, really well. Uh, he said, he said, we want to be the 9-11 commission without 9-11. Yeah. And, and I thought that was a terrific way to, to capture what we were trying to do. I mean, the, your members certainly know the magnitude of this threat and that it's ongoing and that it's happening right now. But there are a lot of people out there that, as you said, it's like watching a submarine war from the beach. You don't really know what's going on. And when I tell people 
you know, that there are utilities that are attacked millions of times a day. I've talked to small banks in Maine that are attacked thousands of times a day. And uh, they, they really are, are surprised by that. And so the, our, our mission is to try, was and is, to try to develop a, a structure of, of uh, organization and defensive maneuver, defensive capabilities, working with the private sector, uh, and also developing a real strategy for the country. And yeah. where you came in that I think is so important is, this problem is not strictly a governmental problem. 85% of the cyber target space is in the private sector. And so uh, the really deepening the relationship between the federal government, which has some real extraordinary capabilities and the private sector is a, is a huge uh, opportunity and, and uh, something that we really have to work on. And that's, that's a lot of what you brought to the table. Well, everybody bought something unique. Hey, let's go through the commission report a little bit. There were three major segments to it. Uh, one was to shape behaviors in cyberspace. Two was to impose costs on our adversary. And three was essentially to deny benefits. So let's kind of take those step by step and really come out with uh, kind of the major uh, uh, outcomes of this report. So first, shape behaviors. Uh, Angus, do you want to describe kind of what we mean by that and, and what the commission report recommended? Well, I, I want to touch on that, but I, I want to sort of go, I, if, if, you, if those are the th first three points, there's point zero, which is reorganize. Yeah. And we'll, be, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But right now, we're not effectively organized to meet this challenge. And so that that's sort of the beginning point for me. But in terms of shape behavior, one of the principles is that we, we're in a new area of conflict. The law of war has developed over hundreds, if not thousands of years, and there's a, there are norms and expectations and guardrails. There, there's no such thing in, in cyber. And so part of it is, for example, one of our specific recommendations is an assistant secretary of state for cyber who would work with the international community because the reality is that whatever you do in cyberspace, if you're trying to impose norms and, and shape behavior, it needs to be multilateral. It can't just be the United States. And we need to be more actively engaged in the development of standards and rules of the road for, for cyber internationally. So that's, that's one of the things when we talk about shaping behavior is uh, you know, trying to define what's, you know, what's permissible conduct and what's, what's off the table. Uh, right. And of course, there'll be violations of that. But uh, certainly, that's something that we, we have to do and shape behavior in another way, which is to, to work with our own people so that their behavior is such that it, it makes us safe. Uh, as you know, uh, a huge amount of the risk is in a sense personal. It's somebody in your operation that answers a phishing email that ends up giving up credentials and then the, 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 we're, we're really in trouble. So shaping behavior both on the internet for everything from the international side all the way to individuals sitting at a, at a, at a laptop at home now uh, understanding the implications of what they're doing. And, and the challenge here is fascinating and that is it's not just shape behaviors and have an understanding among our allies. It's really to make sure that the folks that don't have America's best interests at heart understand the consequences of their action. It is arguable that we have been at this conflict in cyberspace for years with no discernible consequence to the bad guys. So making them understand that there are rules of the road and this is how we should follow them. It's just a big deal. Well, that, and, and in fact, that's one of the reasons, as I mentioned, that I got so engaged in this issue from sitting through hearing after hearing yeah. and realizing that, number one, this is a cheap way to attack us. It opens the uh, attack space to a, a, a lot of different players. And we can defend, you know, we can do cyber hygiene, we can do patching, we can do all the best defensive work possible. 
but unless an adversary feels that there's some cost uh, that they're going to have to bear if they attack us, uh, they're going to keep doing it. I want those guys sitting around the table in the Kremlin to say, man, if we go after that American election again, something bad might happen to us. I want that to be part of their calculus. And as you, you say, right now it isn't. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's an important part of our recommendation is, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be cyber for cyber. It doesn't have to be bombs or missiles, but it, there has to be some response that they know is going to happen. We've got to declare that it's going to happen. And then we've got to back it up. And, and uh, it's, it's not, an, the, the, the academics don't like it when we talk about nuclear deterrence. It's not exactly the same. But I do think the concept of defer, deterrence applies. If there's somebody that's beating you up on the playground every day, ultimately, you're going to have to hit them back or they're going to keep doing it. And that's, yeah. That's where we are right now is that we've been a cheap date in cyber and we've got to be more, uh, uh, I think, more uh, outward facing in terms of, of, of a response. Yeah, and, and like you said, it's, it's not just cyber for cyber. It could be diplomatic, it could be economic, it could be military, um, it could be legal. I mean, so there's a lot of ways to try and hold people accountable. Let's move on to the imposed costs. We just started touching on that. There were a couple of phrases that we used, um, defend forward and persistent engagement. Uh, why don't you give the folks a sense of what we mean by imposed costs? Well, the, uh, those terms that you use, defend forward and persistent engagement, really came out of the work that Cybercom uh, and NSA have done over the last few years. As, as many of you probably know, uh, the, the Cyber Command in the Pentagon and the NSA, the uh, National Security Agency, are run by the same person. Uh, it's a dual, what they call a dual hat, Paul Nakasone, who's an absolutely brilliant guy. Fabulous guy. And yeah. in 2018, in 2018, they were much more, uh, I would say, aggressive in dealing with the threat of Russian interference in those midterm elections. And they... They were in their networks, and at one point they shut down some of the Russian networks, and that shook them up, and and that indicated that we weren't just going to be passive in this. Right. And so uh, that's the that's this uh, persistent engagement means we're not just going to sit back and wait. We're going to be out there on the lines. The analogy is, you know, we we don't uh, have every all of our military force. Uh, here in the states, we, we're we're we've got people in Europe. Uh, that's a kind of forward positioning uh, to uh, alert Russia and before them the Soviet Union that uh, they couldn't just walk in with impunity. It's a it's an analogy to the kind of defend forward means you've got to be out there on the on the front lines. And the other piece I think is important, Tom, is declaration is making it clear what our policy is. Yeah, uh, a capability to deter, a capability to to impose costs isn't any good unless the adversary knows it. Uh, you know, Doctor Strangelove. You know, why did Dimitri? Why didn't you tell us about the Doomsday Machine? Well, the premier likes surprises. You know, but <laughs> a, a deterrent is not a deterrent unless the other side knows that you've got it and that you have the the will to use it. So. Uh, that's what we talk about, uh, about imposing cost. Here's a quick way to think about this, Tom. I did this back the envelope calculation during an armed services committee. Putin can hire 8,000 hackers for the cost of one jet aircraft. Yeah. And that gives you a flavor of why this is going to keep coming at us because it's not terribly expensive. And we're going to see you know, it was in 2016, it was the Russians. Now we've got the Russians and the Chinese that are messing around this election. The Iranians are on the, on the, on the edge of it. North Korea is thinking about it. And we could have a terrorist group do this because it's so relatively easy to do compared with building, you know, uh, uh, aircraft carriers. And, you know, the other emerging problem here, too, is, is beyond the big four, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, is the emergence of, you know, again, drawing on a movie, any kind of James Bond movie, the emergence of Spectre. 
That is where we have essentially worldwide global criminal enterprises or even smaller entrepreneurs in the criminal cyberspace that are using statecraft acquired on the dark web to extort America into certain behavior. Um, they also represent a particular threat that we have to deal with in terms of imposing comps. So this is an incredibly complex problem. But I think the commission would say broadly, enabling the military to do their job, the military and cyber command and any arm of government, uh, FBI, et cetera, to do their job to protect Americans and make us more resilient, uh, I think the commission fully supports that. Hey, let's go to the third, and that is deny benefits. So this is, you know, I, I was kind of big on saying this isn't a matter of cooperation. It must be collaboration between the private sector and, and government in any of its forms. Uh, Angus, tell the folks about that a little bit. Well, part of it is is that relationship that you're talking about, and 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 here's a concrete example, and and it's one that. When you first articulated it, it, people sort of, you know, react. But uh, administrative subpoena for the, uh, the the cybersecurity agency, the CISA, inside uh, Homeland Security. Right. And what we mean by that is not some kind of new government search warrant. But right now, if if we detect, if the government detects a, a malicious attack on a uh, on a particular uh, uh, internet address, uh, then they can't, they don't know who it is. So if they can, if they can go to the ISP and say, you know, where's this IP address? Who is it? Then we can contact the victim and tell them, you know, this is happening. And we can warn others who may be in the same category or under the same level of risk. So it, it's, that's a concrete example of the kind of thing that we're recommending to improve the relationship and the, the relationship of trust and confidence uh, between the private sector. We want to strengthen CISA, not, and we've shied away from mandates and, and, and really we're talking more about how do we work cooperatively? Because as I said at the beginning, 85% of the, of the target is in the, is in the private sector. So, uh, and, and how do we share data? How do we re share reporting? How do, you know, what level of reporting is necessary? Uh, in order to have the government be uh, uh, an effective partner in uh, in responding, so that and this is very tough stuff because there's a natural you know concern among your members and others in the private sector. You know we don't want Big Brother all in, all over our networks and those kinds of things. So we have to work through those things. But the federal government has a lot of resources and a lot of uh, expertise, and uh, this is really a joint enterprise. So, and, and also, we can't boil the ocean here. We can't do everything at once. And so we developed this unfortunate acronym, but it's the right concept of SICI. You've heard of systemically important financial institutions. Well, this is systemically important critical infrastructure. So when you think about the critical infrastructure that is largely owned by the private sector, as you point out, this can't be, if you're engaged in some of that critical infrastructure provision, you must join with the intelligence community, with your sector specific agencies, and even the Department of Defense in really illuminating what the nature of that infrastructure is and how best to make it more resilient. Further, if they get a chance to look in on our critical infrastructure, uh, I think people like US Cyber Command get better insight about the targets set outside the United States. So this idea of identifying in a very rigorous prioritization effort within CESA and government, what are the critical infrastructures that are systemically important? And what are we going to do together to fix it? Well, one of the issues, and, and Tom, this is a, a mission that I'm on uh, these days, and it goes to the heart of what you were just saying. Here's one of the problems that I see from the government side. The intelligence agencies, number one, their base position is hold tight to the data, secret, classified, right. don't exactly. talk about it, don't share it. And, and, and what my contention is that we're in a new world where citizens need the data. 
it's not just the president or the secretary of defense or a few members of Congress. It's the public. For, the best example is the election coming up. The voters are the decision makers. They're the policy makers on November 3rd. So if our intelligence community knows that some kind of malicious activity is going on, they need to tell us. So that can be part of our decision-making calculus as we're going into November 3rd. In the energy sector, if, if they know that, if the intelligence community knows of something that, that one of our adversaries is up to that's aimed at the, at the energy sector, they've got to they gotta tell you. And, and, you know, we go through these complications of, you know, you have to have people that have security clearances and all those kinds of things. But we've got to get over this thing that the U.S. government, that the intelligence community owns the information and doles it out reluctantly. I, I'm, I'm on a mission to make them think more broadly about who their customers are uh, because they do have this kind of information. By the same token, you, your folks have to think of them as a resource, share the information that you have so that it can be a two-way street and it can broaden the street. If, if, you, if the Southern company is getting attacked and if you tell our people that it's CISA or wherever it is, you tell them that this is going on, they can then warn you know, the other major utilities sure. around the country, hey, this is something that's happening. We see it in the South. We better be ready for this. It's a much more effective response if we have that kind of two-way street of information share. Well, and, and let's jump over the word sharing here for a minute. So let's say that we've identified systemically important assets and they are deemed to be sicky, if you will. Um, we've also developed a concept in the commission report about a joint um, analytical environment where um, we have both classified and unclassified spaces where in fact the intelligence community comes together with sector specific agencies the military and the private sector um, and and now instead of having to share hey something happened at southern and guys be aware that for these sicky assets we essentially, through our joined effort, see it at the same time. Because that's really what I want. If, if I have a set of assets that are so important to the infrastructure of electricity flows in America, oh, and by the way, I wanna make sure that uh, telecom is spoken for, because that may be my Achilles heel. I want the government to know it as soon as I know it. I want them to see what I see. It, you know, It's not enough for me to see something and then pick up the phone and call somebody. So this joint uh, analytic environment is, is another recommendation. You wanna chat about that a little bit? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's, that goes back to the very first thing I said. Uh, structure is policy, Tom. Yeah. Uh, uh, Napoleon said war is history and Freud said anatomy is destiny. King says structure is policy. If you have a messy <laughs> structure, you're gonna have messy policy. And what you're talking about, this joint collaborative environment, is creating a structure, a place where it's not all ad hoc. It's not, you don't have to meet each other for the first time in the middle of a crisis, but to create a structure where there can be a regular uh, development of trust and confidence between the government and the private sector, and exactly. then a greater degree of sharing. That's a, I think that's a very important recommendation. Another one is, and you knew I was going to get to this, whether you asked me about it or not, <laughs> is the necessity, the necessity for a national cyber director. Yeah. For someone in the federal government at the highest level, we're recommending it be in the White House, in the executive office of the president, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, similar to the national, to the U.S. trade representative, who can oversee all the different agencies and functions of the federal government in the field of cyber, because right now nobody's in charge. And uh, if I'm the president, I, I want to have somebody that I can hold accountable. If, if something goes wrong, I don't want four different agency heads pointing at one another. I want somebody who gets up every morning and thinks about the risk of cyber and how we can prepare for it. So that's, that's another structural recommendation because right now we've got some really good people, great people in the federal government, but there's no coordination and oversight. And so those are two examples. One is on the federal side, the other is the joint side where structure I think makes a world of difference in terms of our ability 
uh, to make good policy and to execute good policy. Hey, well, let's just stay with structure for a minute. And so talk about the select committee concept in, uh, in Congress. Well, that was, <laughs> that's maybe our toughest, uh, our toughest recommendation to make Piece happen. Piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've, done, we've done pretty well with our recommendations, uh, I should mention, in the National Defense Authorization Act, which I think we have about a dozen of our recommendations are in both the House and the Senate bill. There's another 12 or 13 in the House bill, six or eight in the, in the Senate bill. If we can reconcile, we may get 20 to 25 of our recommendations out of 52 into law this fall, uh, which is pretty amazing. It's unbelievable, yeah. Uh, but, and that's been a lot of work. I should have mentioned at the beginning, we've had an unbelievable staff on this commission. Mark Montgomery, our executive director, is just Terrific. brilliant. And a lot of the the ability to execute has been because of great staff work. For example, we didn't just make recommendations. If the recommendation involved legislation, we wrote the legislation. We gave the committees and the committee staff written, finished, a finished bill, not just, <coughs> you know, go off and do something on this. And I think that's a, that's been a very important part of, of, of the staff work that's really underlay the, su the success that we've had so far. So, um, you know, there's a lot still to do. Uh, we've got we're, one of our recommendations is we extend the committee for the commission for a year to try to finish some of these other items that aren't that aren't yet completed. But uh, uh, getting that uh, getting those getting that uh, those recommendations into law, of course, is is the whole idea. Well, as a consumer of Congress, you know, uh, I, I walk the halls pretty frequently and navigating the different committees. So this idea of the select approach would be to pull right. together some of the uh, chairs of the different committees that have current jurisdiction for, for a lot of good reason. And bring well, that together as you do the, Intel, right? That's right. And, and, and the, the analogy to intelligence is, is exactly right. In 19, there were no intelligence committees before 1976 and the church committee uh, looked into the activities of the CIA and they decided that their intelligence over, uh, oversight was scattered throughout the Congress. They needed to focus. So they created the two intelligence committees, one in the House and one in the Senate in 1976. Our recommendation is to do the same thing now with cyber. Tom, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this, but remember I mentioned all those amendments that we've gotten into the National Defense Act? It yeah. required 180 different clearances. <laughs> from both sides of committees and subcommittees throughout both houses of Congress to get there. And, and right now, the organization of Congress is, is mimics the disorganization in the executive branch. We've got all these different committees that have pieces of it, but the hardest thing in the world is to ask a, a, a congressional committee to give up jurisdiction. So we've, we've proposed a select committee on cyber, but to have some of the uh, chair and ranking member of some of those <laughs> committees of jurisdiction beyond the new committee, so they don't feel like they're losing. That's a tough, it's a, I, 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 I gotta admit, it's a tough haul uh, because changing the congressional structure is really hard. But uh, Jim Risch and I, for example, had a very uh, straightforward bill on, on security of the grid, as a matter yep. of fact, to do some study. It took us three years, and we finally got it through as part of, I think, the uh, National Defense Act last year. But, uh, you know, it was, there was nothing ter terribly controversial about it, but it was just everybody had a piece of it, and therefore nothing happened. Hey, uh, Angus, uh, uh, one more thing to kind of wrap up the public-private side and deny benefits. You know, as as the leader of one of America's major utilities, I really view the idea of a SICKI designation, systemically important infrastructure, the idea of a joint collaborative analytic environment where we're right there sitting next to the intelligence community, sector of physical agencies at all. That is so valuable to me because it reduces my risk for the bad guys to get into my infrastructure. It is so valuable. But you've been in the private sector. Uh, obviously, we're in the private sector. There have got to be, along with these benefits, some burdens, some level of accountability uh, for those companies that have systemically important infrastructure 
to make sure that their cyber hygiene is done appropriately in the national security interest of America. Let's talk a little bit about, we had some pretty good debates about what are the benefits and burdens and what, are, what should we reasonably expect um, big private companies to, to stand up to in terms of their hygiene? Well, one, one of our recommendations, and, and you're, you're, you're right to point out, we're, we're talking about a lot of benefits to, to your industry and other industries by having uh, the government better organized and, and uh, sharing intelligence and sharing information. That's, those are important benefits. So, you know, what are the burdens? One is uh, to require CEOs of major corporations to sign off on their cyber hygiene. Uh, to uh, to make a just as you now have to sign under Sarbanes Oxley, you now have yep. to certify your financial solvency. We're proposing that you have to certify your cyber solvency. Now, some people are going to say, "Oh no, that's federal regulation. That's too burdensome." Well, you know, we're all in this together, and I believe that's not an unreasonable requirement. And I like the idea of the CEO. You you're a CEO. Uh, you, once you have to sign something like that, you suddenly are going to ask tougher questions of your of your CIO uh, and your cybersecurity people to be sure you can you can sign off. So that's one of the things that we that we've talked about that I think is important. We're talking about certifying the security of cloud. We think it's overall it's <coughs> it's more secure to store data on the cloud, but we ought to be sure that we're that it's that it's being done safely. The other thing, and we're talking about large companies, but um, we're proposing a kind of cyber uh, UL label, right. voluntary, but uh, because all of a sudden, I mean, and the pandemic has taught us, you and I have been working from home for six months, but we're doing pretty important work, sometimes classified work, and sometimes very important, you know, there's a lot of data going back and forth. We've got a We've got to be able, so when people go to buy a home router, they ought to know whether it's got the latest patches, whether it's, it's, whether it's safe and secure. And we're talking about developing a voluntary certification, just like UL, when you buy a lamp or a toaster, that will tell the consumer that this, is, this product, at least at this moment in time, is safe. So those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. We, we didn't want to make this a regulatory commission. We didn't want to have a lot of rules and regulations. I don't think that's the best way to do it. We're trying to provide incentives right. and, and, and uh, pathways for collaboration. But some of them, like the requirement to certify cyber, what I call cyber solvency, I think that's not an unreasonable requirement. Oh, no. Listen, I, I have very little patience with people that want to argue against this one, whether they know it or not. Your ability to secure your own networks uh, and your own cyber assets, if you will, is a requirement, particularly if you are involved in a safety sense. That is that the operation of your business is directly impacting national security. You should stand up to the uh, obligation to assure that everything that you know to do is being done properly. This assessment would be carried out under the control evaluation uh, by your accounting firm as part of your Sarbanes-Oxley uh, uh, total evaluation. And the other thing you mentioned, CEOs having to sign, well, CFOs have to sign that as well. And you wanna know who's gonna approve it is our boards of directors. And so getting that chain of command involved in evaluating uh, Cybersecurity is absolutely the right thing. Absolutely the right thing. So uh, I think we came out to a good spot there. Um, so that's the report. It's now traveling through Congress. Uh, there's a whole lot more in there. I encourage people, there's a pretty good summary. What is it, about maybe 20 pages, something like that. Right. It's really pretty easy reading. And I think it really gets to the heart of so many important issues. We've really just kind of touch the tops of the waves here as, as Angus and I have been chatting about it. Um, so we have some ability right now to attach to some Defense Authorization Act traveling through. What about the rest of the provisions? Is there a chance to take those on directly? Do we let those go? What's your sense about the rest of the report? Well, they're, they're, we're going to keep at it and, and the, the, the sort of uh, 
book uh, bookend to the National Cyber Director, which is, I think, one of our most important recommendations. The other one is a continuity of the economy. Yeah. Uh, requiring the federal government to do continuity of the economy planning. Uh, we now, there already has been for some years, continuity of government. What happens in the case of a catastrophic attack? How do we continue to maintain uh, our civil infrastructure, our, you know, our civil and civic infrastructure, but we need to talk about continuity of the economy and, and what would happen? What are, I want, if, if something unthinkable happens, I want people to have thought about it before and planned and had, uh, had a, a, there's a, you know, a book on the shelf you can pull off. Of, and that one I see is Jimmy Buffett, but maybe <laughs> you don't want Jimmy Buffett, but uh, to have a, a set of plans that, uh, that, you know, will, will be useful and, and used uh, in, that, in that situation. You don't wanna have to improvise on the fly. And, and Tom, if there's anything, I mean, the pandemic has taught us a lot of things, but to sure me, has. the biggest lesson of the pandemic is the unthinkable can happen. If we'd been sitting here a year ago and you said, we're gonna have something that's gonna virtually shut down the economy, put millions of people out of work, uh, hundreds, hundred thousand more people are going to die. You, you know, nobody would have said, "Oh no, that's that's not going to happen." In fact, at the very beginning, people didn't believe it. In fact, I think a lot of people still don't believe it, or yeah. still don't really absorb how serious it is and how dangerous it is. And and so we've learned that these kinds of, of enormous catastrophes can occur, and uh, we've got to be ready for them. Your industry, certainly everybody knows, is a, is a prime target. Let me mention one other thing in energy. It bothers me. You, you guys, your grid, your, your generating capacity is all subject to some pretty serious uh, oversight by FERC, and, and you've got your own organization. I can never remember. It starts with N that uh, governs your, your... Yeah. FERC and NERC. Yeah, yeah NERC. Yeah. And then we have... And then we have info for nuclear. So we got a lot. But, but there's nothing comparable for gas pipelines, Tom. Yes, sir. Gas pipelines are regulated by TSA. And in New England, I don't know how about your generating mix, but in New England, about 60% of our electricity comes from gas pipelines. All of the gas comes from somewhere else. So to me, gas pipelines are part of the, ener of the electrical energy infrastructure. I mean, you know, you guys can protect your grid and your substations and your transformers and everything else. But if the pipeline system goes down, we don't have any power in New England right now. Yeah. So yeah. that's a that's a sort of that's an area where I think we have to we have to really pay some attention. I just I, I mentioned that parenthetically, but being a New Englander, it's something I think about. But and here's what I want folks to know at EEI as well. When you talk about resilience of the economy, I know we had a seminal moment in one of our war games, GridX. I forget which one it was, but a recent critic, where we had a representative of government and you know, one of the things we went through was a national emergency, the president authorized through the FAST Act, the Secretary of Energy to take over you know, electricity operations in the United States. Well, they really don't know how to do it. When we think about collaboration, this must be a hand in glove relationship between the private sector and government in order to make America resilient. So uh, we all have a, an enormous interest in making sure we yeah. lean in appropriately. And, hey, Angus, and, last minute or so. Um, yeah. What closing thoughts would you give to our industry? You've been in our industry and you've uh, dealt with the very serious national security issues. What advice can you give us having been through the Solarium effort and the energy uh, uh, committee you're on in, in the Senate? What can we do better? How can we help? Well, I think the last point you made is a really important one because you talk about government and industry working hand in glove. That doesn't come naturally. There's a natural suspicion and, and, and sort of keep our distance kind of thing and a lack of trust. And I think one of the biggest things we need to do as a society is to break that down, is to, is to, is to form those relationships of confidence and trust so that when there's an emergency, we can work together in a seamless kind of way. I realize I'm talking in cliches here, talking about seamless and hand in glove, but, but the reality is we've got to change the culture of viewing government and business as some kind of hostile forces. 
Yeah. And be, because I, I just think, particularly in your business, it's so essential to the functioning of the country. Uh, we've got to have a relationship. And part of it is personal. Part of it is having people who know each other yeah. and uh, work together and know each other on a first name basis. I think building that kind of relationship is the most important thing that your industry and, and the government can do right now. And I'm hoping that the solarium has laid the groundwork for that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hey, well, Senator Angus King, thank you so much, sir. It's been an honor to work with you on solarium. And thank you for everything you do in America. Uh, you know, uh, I guess you're technically an independent. And I think you really have demonstrated over the years that you do what's best for America, uh, irrespective of kind of the affiliation. You really do exercise independent judgment. And we thank you for that. You've been a great public servant for this country. Thank you, Tom. Great to work with you and look forward to continuing our work together as we, as we execute on the vision that was created uh, by the work that we've already done. You bet. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir.